Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to greet you once again. And today we have a very special guest who is joining us for the second time this year, and we are very happy for that. Uh, her name is Monica Steinbock. She was born in Mexico City, and she comes from a, a family with a German background. She has a bachelor's degree in art history and a master's and a doctorate degree in comparative literature, both from the UNAM, that is the National Autonomous University of Mexico, where she is currently teaching German literary history. She has also collaborated with other universities and cultural institutions, such as the Universidad Iberoamericana, the Instituto de Cultura Superior, the National Museum of Anthropology, and the Museum of San Ildefonso, among others. Her interests are interdisciplinary, and she specializes in issues related to religious and poetic phenomena, myths, symbols, and cultural identities. And today she will speak about that fantastic painter, Joaquin Clausel, uh, the epic of intimacy. Welcome, Monica, and thank you for being with thank us. Thank you very much, Elena. Good evening to everyone. I'm going to take a seat here. And uh, well, I have to thank you again for inviting me to this uh, course where I can actually give this conference because Clausel is really an amazing and a very outstanding painter that has been misinterpreted sometimes. So I think we're going to clear some things up and I think it will be very interesting. Okay, the title of uh, this talk is The Epic of an Intimacy. And I want to start with a uh, quote of Octavio Paz when he was asked about Clausel, like, what about Clausel? He answered, perhaps it came too late. In order to understand this statement by Octavio Paz, it will be necessary to reconstruct at least partially uh, the context and the, of the work and also of the life of Joaquin Clausel. He was born in Campeche in 1866 as the only child of a Spanish merchant and a Mexican mother. Uh, the early passing of the father left his mother and him without any economic resources and therefore he had to work as a child to make ends meet. So he had a very hard childhood. And his biographies uh, state that he was a very rebellious child when he was smaller. And the first problem he ran into when he was just 16 years old uh, was uh, a, a problem with the governor of Campeche, okay, Joaquin Barranda, uh, because he criticized the government in a public speech during a school event. And this did not only uh, get him out of his school, but he was also expelled of the state of Campeche by the governor personally. <laughs> And therefore, he had to travel to Mexico, to Mexico City, and see how he would go get along. And actually, he survived by washing dishes in restaurants. Okay, despite his precarious uh, economical situation, he managed to enroll in the Escuela de Minería because he wanted to become an engineer. But later on, he changed into law school where he became politically active. And he helped to organize one of the most famous demonstrations against the Porfirio Diaz regime. And uh, this was actually not the only time he ran into trouble with Mexican authorities, okay? Uh, because uh, he was very committed to his ideals and he was a fierce adversary to uh, the Mexican reelection. And another thing that points out his personality he did not like heroic enhancements of people in power. Okay? Mm -hmm. That means uh, Joaquin Barrada, he wanted actually to give another name to Campeche. And he was going to be Campeche of Barrada. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Clausel said Campeche is Mexico, it is not of Barrada. And actually, that was the main problem he had, and that's why he was actually expelled from Campeche. Okay? Uh, he became a journalist and even founded a newspaper, it was called El Democrata, but it lasted only for three months. Okay? It lasted from February to April of 1893 because he was detained by an article he had published, and as a consequence, his newspaper was shut down. 
Okay? Fortunately, he could escape the day of his prosecution trial. He was helped by a very uh, influential family, and he fled first to the United States, and later on uh, he went to Europe, and he had contact with the Parisian artistic avant-garde. Okay, among the people he met there, uh, we have Camille Pizarro and Emile Sola, which everybody knows who they are, and both of them encouraged him to follow his vocation to paint. Actually, his uh, painting has a lot of influence from Camille Pizarro. Okay? Back in Mexico, he started painting, but at the age of 35, which is quite late for a painter. And due to his friendship with the most important and famous Mexican painters of that time, uh, he became well known, and that in spite of not uh, dating or signing his paintings and not having any interest in, in promoting his work on the public level. Because of his pictorial technique and the undeniable influence of Pizarro and other Impressionist painters, Clausel has been labeled in Mexico as Impressionistic. But in reality, his work belongs to the realm of the imaginary and has a completely different intention. Impressionism and impressionistic pictorial technique came to Mexico while Porfirio Diaz was still in power. Okay. Uh, these are the friends of, of uh, Clausel. We know Nauriolin, we know Dr. Apple, uh, we know Jesus Contreras, uh, Julio Ruelas, uh, Frida Kahlo, and of course Diego Rivera. And they liked him very much. They promoted his paintings even though he was not interested. And uh, then we have the uh, avant-garde, yes, the last exhibition organized by the Impressionists over there. And uh, it is very important to recall that uh, uh, when Impressionism comes to Mexico, it has already been recognized in Europe as a valid way to paint. Okay, so Impressionist was not seen as a rebellion against academic painting. On the contrary, it was officially acclaimed by the Academia of San Carlos as an other possibility to show how open-minded Mexican official institutions are or were regarding progress in history. French Impressionists organized their last important exhibition in Paris in 1886. Okay, at that time, Clausel was enrolled in law school and had not painted anything except for some cartoons at school of his teachers, his schoolmates, and of course, of the governor of Campeche. <laughs> okay? One friend recalls that he had painted the governor of Campeche with all his medals and his uh, uniform, and then uh, in order to paint the sword, he always wore, he painted just like a little sword like that. Sword actually stands for the heroic uh, achievements someone has. So that meant he had no heroic achievements at all. So uh, he always uh, did that because he didn't like uh, this protagonic type of, of people that want to like last in history or have their name someplace forever and ever, okay? Um, at the first contact Clausel has with the French avant-garde is 1893. Okay, that is seven years after the last uh, uh, exhibition, no, the one prior, at the last exhibition we can see here. The last exhibition is very important to state that it is like the brink of other uh, pictorial proposals. We have Puntillismo already, and we have Odilon Redon with symbolism uh, there, and we also have uh, Gauguin, so we do not speak about the pure impressionistic technique any longer. And that's seven years before Clausel came into contact with impressionism. That's why uh, we have to rethink this impressionistic label we have uh, categorized uh, Clausel. As a consequence, impressionism in Mexico has a very different function. Okay? It is not the light and the incident of light of an object Mexican artists are interested in, but rather the potential inherent to new pictorial techniques that might have helped them to shape a strong national identity. And this didn't happen only with Impressionism, 
but with other European avant-garde as well. To mention a few more, we have Expressionism, Cubism, Futurism, and Surrealism, uh, used with exactly the same intention and with the same purpose. Okay? Um, you can go on. Okay. German Hermann Kedorius and Daniel Davila. We can see already used some impressionist, te impressionist techniques and they are academic uh, teachers. So impressionism is used in Mexico as a common technique, even before Clausel had contact with the avant-garde. Um, after the quest for the credible, for a credible and national identity uh, went on after the Mexican Revolution and became internationally famous with Mexican muralism and with painters uh, like Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alvarado Cirqueiros. Okay, here we have uh, some example that is before the Mexican Revolution, how uh, we uh, conceive our identity through painting and through art. Okay, the first Mexican painter, stated like a Mexican painter, is Jose Maria Velasco. And the reason for that is because he has a, a painting signed Jose Maria Velasco de Mexico from Mexico. In fact, uh, it is uh, based this uh, kind of painting on an Italian, on an Italian painting uh, proposal. And the master of uh, Velasco was Landesio, and Landesio was Italian, and they paint in a very, like a very similar way. Then we also have like. Uh, trying to uh, enhance the heroism of the indigenous people with uh, kind of very uh, funny paintings like we have this uh, painting over there and uh, also with Mexican traditions we want to have Dia de Muertos we have Saturnino Errán here with uh, yeah we have Saturnino Errán here with a painting in Cepasuchitl which is the flower we use to uh, ornament our altars with um, uh, we have uh, also Jose Guadalupe Posada, I think he has become the most famous one nowadays because of Vida de Muertos and also because of uh, the film of James Bond uh, where we have all these skeletons uh, related to Mexico and being like part of a Mexican identity. Can you put the next one? Okay, after the Mexican Revolution, we still have, are uh, trying to have a proper image uh, that will go with our identity, uh, especially the one we want to project to uh, the rest of the country. And we have painters, obviously, like Diego Rivera, like Orozco, like O'Gorman, and uh, many more. Uh, you can see we have always the Mexican emblem, like the eagle, with a snake or uh, some scenes from the Mexican Revolution with uh, social content. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, even though Clausel was self taught and very private and solitary in his work, and his work has no parallel, he cannot be separated from his historic time and space and from the specific political situation in Mexico. Next. Furthermore, Clausel was emotionally attached to his homeland and very concerned about the gap that existed between the real situation in Mexico and the image Mexicans wanted to project abroad. And he had expressed this with the paintings he produced in the walls of his private studio. So you can see he has a lot of Mexican flags. This is uh, actually the motherland, La Patria, which is a very nice uh, painting. It's all on the mural of his studio. Okay, and uh, so uh, after he returned from Paris, he was no longer active as a journalist, but he became a lawyer and kept up his commitment to social justice till his death in 1935. Please change. So you can see he was director of orphanages. He used to defend people that had no means to pay a lawyer and he did not actually charge for his services. So he was like a big philanthropist in that way. We have also here an idea what Mexico looked like in the 19th, early 20th century. And uh, 
it was still a very poor country uh, with of course contrast with the rich because the Mexican Revolution brought, brought changes but many of the rich people uh, kept their status some point. okay go on okay Jaucel was interested in painting landscapes as a symbolical element of national identity. Uh, this uh, was funny because I was at Annalena's office and he, she has a Popocatep also there and it's also a symbol of national identity. And uh, he used short, vigorous brush strokes to enhance his paint. This is the reason why Clausel has been defined by art critics as the Mexican Impressionist painter par excellence, with a stress on Mexico. Next one. Okay, uh, here we can see uh, many of his paintings uh, are landscapes. Many of these landscapes actually are known Mexican landmarks. These are the gardens of Tlalpan, and we have the Path of Nezahualcoyotl, and then we have, of course, some seascapes. He was very famous for his seascapes. Um, where was he? To uh, defend this categorization, critics tend to separate the mural on his studio from the rest of his work. For instance, the Mexican art critic Raquel Tibol made the following remark. The paintings in his studio are imaginary. Here he imagined things based on some notes or scribbling he made outdoors. We have to interpret most of them as inventions. I personally disagree with this statement. His outdoor paintings, these are outdoor paintings of Clausel, are intimately related to the paintings executed on the wall of his studio. It is this studio that sheds a different light on his work and forces us to reconsider Clausel's flavor as an impressionist or a late impressionist. Clausel's color palette is far from the one used by French impressionists. Color, crucial for his paintings like black, ochre, and brown, are carefully avoided by French impressionists because they tend to darken the paintings. Impressionists evade shadows whenever possible, and if a dark color is needed, they juxtapose different secondary colors to make it bright. It is not only the color that marks the difference, but also the way Clausel creates a dim and mystical atmosphere. Next. Uh, okay. The atmosphere. Okay, it is merely the preference for the unusual composition and the free brush strokes that relate him to impressionism. Neither his aesthetic intention nor his pictorial expression. He doesn't choose to paint landscapes as a reaction to indoor academic paintings. He does not rebel against the excessive importance of passion uh, essential to a romantic artist and as a consequence he is not interested in creating a pseudo scientific distance to make objective statements. The Mexican critic Justino Fernandez qualifies his work as nature seen through a temperament, naturaleza vista a través de un temperamento. But I think it is the other way around. Clausel's strong emotional distinctiveness opens a whole new way to interpret landscapes in a mystical and religious way. There is a big difference to see nature through a temperament than a temperament using nature to express your most intimate religious feelings. Okay. Next. Okay. He must have had an uncontrollable urge to paint. We know he painted on any material he had at hand paper, tissue, cardboard, even shoe boxes. Okay, the ones we have here are spe on, specifically on cardboard. Coming back from the painting outings he used to organize mainly with his best friend, Dr. Adel, he is a very famous painter in Mexico too, he would lock himself up in the studio and clean his brushes on the wall. Next. The stains left by the brushes would inspire him to create landscapes, animal representations, portraits, fictional characters, historical events or passages from the Bible. 
he would capture anything that would randomly come to his mind, taking advantage not only of this much left by his brushes, but of the imperfections of the wall itself. If this is the case, next one, please. Okay, this is the case on the left side of a lion uh, with an open snout painted inside a slit with, uh, where there was compact plaster. Actually, this is not the actual lion because I didn't find a, a picture of that one, but uh, it is very similar to this. And the slit is exactly where the snout is. So uh, that is interesting. Unfortunately, the slit was accidentally repaired Mm -hmm. during one of the restorations. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, we have a Christ and uh, the uh, uh, side injury, uh, the Christ that is also a problem of the wall. We have a slit there too. So he would use anything uh, that would be like different to make a painting around. This attitude shows that Clausel was not structured or premeditated. He acts and paints, impulsively allowing his interior world to emerge. Next. I cannot imagine that this was different when he was outdoors. His seascapes, and they are very famous and highly quoted in Mexico, his mountains, his woods, his prairies, even his historical sites, are the perfect pretext to express not the light shining upon objects, but his most inner feelings. It is not science that makes him experiment with colors and textures, but an urge to open a spiritual atmosphere in order to reveal a poetic religiousness based on the beauty of the ephemeral. Passions are not measurable. They can only be shared by empathy. They are vulnerable, depend on mood swings, and are easily influenced by circumstances. Clausel's pictorial language is very intense. Distorted by his own passion, his aesthetic intention transfigures himself into mystical experiences. Confronted with the paintings on the wall of his studio, we can clearly see how his prerogatives used to change with the passing of time. Parts of the left side of the mural show a rectangular, another one, uh, shaped framing around paintings. This confines the composition to a limited space, making it look like windows. Okay, there was an article called uh, The uh, Room with a Thousand Windows, mm -hmm. and it was actually inspired in this thing of framing uh, the paintings. On the opposite side, next one, however, frames become scarce and one scene connects with another in a free and randomly way. Dimensions, harmony, and balance are relegated to the background, and the mural transfigures itself into an incredibly strong and violent work of art. The impressionist landscapes that are scattered throughout the whole mural are integrated into this context and can no longer keep their independent meaning. They lose their scientific intention their impartiality and their decorative faculty to become part of an ever-changing personal imaginary. As already stated, I believe that the paintings by Clausel that do not belong to the studio are part of this imaginary as well and should be interpreted accordingly. Next one. Clausel's indifference regarding the aesthetic prerogative of French Impressionism and this compulsive attitude towards painting as an act by itself was and still is not well received by critics. They accuse him of not having the necessary technical skill to paint properly. However, it is precisely the subordination of technical skills to passion that makes Clausel's work so unique. He is not looking for formal perfection, but for a cosmic affinity capable of solving his very personal identity problems. He kept the murals in the studio very private, allowing only close friends to visit. This is actually, that happens a lot in Mexico, because the need of a private space where you could express yourself without the danger of being censured 
censored or, uh, censored or politically misused actually, was crucial to other Mexican modernist paintings as well. I know, for instance, the painter Julio Ruelas, or even Germán Gedovius, was a professor at San Carlos. They all have their, uh, like their private sanctuary, where they could uh, solve their private pro uh, problems without anybody listening or, or, or questioning. So this was nothing which was different to other uh, modernist painters. Clausel's private realm is the key to his inner universe. Entering the room, we are practically overwhelmed by a blast of colors configuring shapes, frames, landscapes, animals, monsters, devils, angels, fairy tales characters, phantoms, historical happenings, and much more. What the beholder is looking at is an expression of a mystical experience strong enough to burst any rational approach. Therefore, we have to address the mural from a religious point of view. Can you please change? Okay. Now, I'm going to give an example of what a religious point of view means. Okay. Among the last images painted by Clausel is a young woman standing out like a goddess. Her hair falls down her shoulders like a curtain of a dark waterfall sliding down her robe. The other side of her face is limited by a geometric hairline that works as a sort of frame similar to the rectangular frames Clausel painted throughout his mural. The most evident symbolic meaning attached to this image is the one of a mountain. There are a couple of persons climbing towards the summit. You can see them here, okay. climbing towards the summit. Besides this, there are other religious archetypes converging in this image, one of which is the concept of the center. Okay. Mirce Eliade states that every spiritual place, space sorry, needs to have a center. This center is the emotional reference that allows the space to exist and keeps it stable. The center has no geometrical implication because it, is, it opens to a sacred space that differs from abs 